up the scene here. So Moses is on Mount Sinai. Mm -hmm. God's giving him the Ten Commandments. He comes down, again, I'm looking at the movie, sorry. The movie's pretty accurate there. He comes down off the mountain, and he sees them making the golden calf. He gets upset. Yes, he does. Why is he upset? He, they didn't know they weren't supposed to make the golden calf. He has the Ten Commandments in his pocket. Yeah, but he told them that before he... He never gave the gold, he never gave the Ten Commandments yet. Okay, here we go. When the people, I'm looking at chapter 32 of Exodus. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So hold on just a moment. I think this actually answers the question, which is, they know they're making other gods. They know they're turning away from the God that did all these signs and wonders that brought them out of Egypt, that parted the Red Sea for them, that brought them this far. They know they're betraying God. So that, that's pretty obvious. And you know, it's true. We know a lot more about God than the people 3,500 years ago did. We, we've seen a lot more of God's revelation in history. And you know, we're held to a higher standard because of that. We we're able to know so much more about God than they did. And yet, we know that there is a natural moral law in the heart of every human being. And that these early people, before Ten Commandments, they still knew right from wrong. They still had a conscience. God was still speaking to them in the depths of their heart. So uh, the New Testament says that we're without excuse. It says the Gentiles who don't know the law, they're still without excuse because God writes the law on our hearts. Uh, let's start in the book of Exodus. Let's open up to chapter 1, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 11. These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his household. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan and Naphtali, Gad and Asher. All the offspring of Jacob were 70 persons. Joseph was already in Egypt. There we get the 12 sons of Jacob, the 12 tribes of Israel. Then Joseph died, and all his brothers, and all that generation. But the descendants of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong, so that the land was filled with them. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Behold, the sons of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And if war befall us, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. And they built for Pharaoh store cities, Python and Ramses. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread of the sons of Israel. There's a lot to unpack here. At the end of the book of Genesis, Joseph was Grand Vizier of Egypt. And more than that, the hero of the nation. He saved Egypt and all the surrounding countries from famine. He invited his father Jacob also known as Israel. So the sons of Israel, the children of Israel, are literally the descendants of Jacob. Good to know and pack away in your brain. Joseph invited his father Jacob, his 11 brothers and their families, to come down and live in Egypt. Then a new pharaoh arose who did not know what Joseph had done for Egypt, and he made the Israelites slaves for 400 years. This lines up very well with what we know of history from outside sources. Here's what happened. When Joseph came to Egypt, Egypt was being ruled by Canaanite foreigners. That's why the Pharaoh welcomed Joseph with open arms. Joseph wasn't some foreigner. He's one of them. A group called the Hyksos ruled Egypt for about a century and a half. They were a conglomeration of different ethnic groups who came out of, uh, of the Near East, mostly out of Canaan, they took on Egyptian ways, rose in government, and slowly gained control of most of the country. By 1720 BC, they ruled the eastern part of the Nile Delta. So by 
1720, the Hyksos gained control of this eastern part of Egypt. That right there is the land of Goshen. That is where the Israelites lived. That was the, uh, the good pasture land. That's where the Hyksos first moved in, found their base. And then about 40 years later, Memphis up there, excuse me, Memphis is modern-day Cairo, Thebes is modern-day Luxor with the Valley of the Kings. So, 40 years later, they, had, they were ruling from Memphis or Thebes? 40 years later, they're ruling from Memphis. They never do take Thebes. In Thebes, you've got a rival Egyptian dynasty that wants to drive out the Hyksos rulers in Memphis. Now, it really seems likely that Joseph came into the country while the Hyksos rulers were ruling at least Goshen, perhaps Memphis. And that's how he rose to power so quickly. Because he was one of them. Because he was one of them. So for about 100 years after they take Memphis, there's a bloody on and off civil war until finally the Egyptian dynasty in Thebes drive out to the Hyksos and they once again rule all of Egypt. Sometime during this on and off civil war, one of the Egyptian pharaohs said, come, let us deal shrewdly with the Hebrews, lest they join our enemies and fight against us. The Hebrews were natural allies of the Hyksos. When the Hyksos were driven out of the country, the Hebrews became slaves. So secular history fits really well with the Joseph story there. Um, but famously, the Exodus story does not. We do not have a good idea of the date and historical context of the Exodus story. The Egyptians never mention it in any of their historical records. That's not too surprising. We know the pharaohs and their scribes often omitted to record incidents that were embarrassing to the king or to the nation. Also, unhelpfully, the book of Exodus does not name its two pharaohs. It's not too surprising. Before the time of Solomon, the pharaohs were usually just called plain pharaoh, not pharaoh Necho or pharaoh Shishak like they were later on. But this means we can't pin down a date. We can't even pin down a dynasty. The two most likely proposed dates for the Exodus are more than a century apart. The early date, 1446 B.C., the late date, sometime around 1280 B.C. Thank you. Oh, King David? Well, here, I'll, I'll, I'll describe a little. This is the backtracking date. This comes from 1 Kings, where it says that the Exodus happened 480 years before the Temple of Solomon was built. That gives you, and we know when the Temple of Solomon was built, so that gives us a solid 1446 B.C. What's the problem? 480 years. That's 40 years of wandering in the wilderness times 12 tribes of Israel gives you 480 years. It really smacks of being a symbolic number. People do go back and count the reigns of the judges. I mean, you can go back from, you know, through the reign of Solomon, of David, of Solomon, back through the reigns of the judges. Unfortunately, the reigns of the judges overlap. They rule different parts of the country at different times. There might be gaps in between them. There might be three or four ruling at once. You can't get solid dates off of the reign of the judges, which is really annoying because it makes all the earlier dates hard to come by. So the later date, 1280 BC, this approximate date comes from Exodus chapter 12 where it says the Israelites were in Egypt for 430 years. This assumes Joseph and his family came to Egypt during the reign of the Hyksos and were taken into slavery when the Hyksos were driven out of Egypt. That's, this is the scholarly estimate, so to speak, based on the Joseph story and on 430 years of slavery. This date also seems to mesh better with the archaeological evidence of the conquest. Around 1280 BC, you've got the Edomites and the other tribes mentioned later on. You've got them living in that area, and you've got evidence of burned cities when uh, Joshua and the Israelites come into the Promised Land. So I tend to plump for this date. It's the date that uh, is on the handout. This handout is based on Jeff Cavins' uh, timeline through Ascension Press. So pick your date. That's right, 
if you're going for the early date, the pharaoh is Thutmose the third, who was a long-lived pharaoh who could have died, you know, right in the middle of Moses' life. Um, but if you're going for the 1280 BC date, that's where you get Ramses. Ramses the second. Um, the name Ramses shows up in the book of Exodus in several places, not overtly naming the pharaoh, but it's connected with the building projects of the Israelites. You know, this was the storehouse of Ramses. This was the project of Ramses. So people have tended to latch onto that name. Hollywood certainly did. In the movies, Ramses is always the pharaoh of the Exodus, and his father, Seti, is always the pharaoh who orders the death of the Hebrew baby boys. In the end, we don't really know. We don't have enough evidence to pin it down. Eh, that's probably the best hypothesis out there. Um, this date, incidentally, makes the period of the judges awfully long, and this date makes the period of the judges awfully short. Um, one last, uh, let's see, uh, item of scholarship before we move back into the text. Authorship of Exodus. The book of Exodus comes from Moses. But how much did he write himself? That is perpetually open to question. Traditionally, Moses is considered to have written the entire Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. The book of Exodus itself doesn't say who wrote it. It does, however, tell us that Moses was literate and that he wrote down the law he received from God. Now, Moses can't have written the entire Pentateuch by anyone's reckoning because the end of the book of Deuteronomy talks about his death. So uh, that's a little hard for him to write. And also the book of Numbers, it says, Now, Moses was a very humble man, more humble than anyone on the face of the earth. If Moses wrote that, he's not as humble as he claimed. <laughs> Modern scholars mostly subscribe to the documentary hypothesis, where the Pentateuch is considered a composite of four historical documents. We talked about this in the Genesis class, so I'm going to pass through this pretty quickly. But you have J, the Yahwist source, the main source, written not long after King David. You've got E, the Elohist source, 8th century BC or thereabouts. You've got D, the Deuteronomistic source, uh, time of King Josiah and the reform. And finally you have P, the priestly source, it's believed to come from after the exile. Then you get a final edit of the whole Pentateuch around the 400s BC. That's the loose consensus of modern scholarship. The dates change depending on who you read like crazy. The Catholic Church has no official teaching on who wrote the Pentateuch. But it has urged modern scholars to be careful not to write Moses out of the story. We do believe that the book of Exodus contains the original law of Moses. Yes, sirree, he brought down those Ten Commandments, and they were recorded and remembered along with a lot of other laws. And we do believe that it tells the historical story of the Exodus. Like the book of Genesis, Exodus includes a large number of details that support the historical time and place of the story. Here's a few just for fun. Exodus uses a lot of Egyptian language words in it. It uses a lot of Egyptian names. Even the name Moses is Egyptian. It's not Hebrew. It's actually a short version of the name Ramses or Ra Moses. Uh, the book of Exodus accurately describes the conditions of slavery in Egypt in the second millennium BC. We know from other sources there were armed taskmasters. There were slaves from Canaan and elsewhere. There were quotas of bricks. The author is familiar with the Egyptian agricultural calendar. He's familiar with the technology, the Egyptian building technology of the time. The uh, tabernacle, its interlocking joints, its wood framing with gold overlay. These are skills they would have learned as builders in Egypt. The tabernacle itself is made of acacia wood, which grows in Egypt in the wilderness of Sinai, but not in Canaan. So all these details of the story and more are things that a later Canaanite writer would have trouble would have trouble with. It wouldn't come naturally to them if they were passing the story on for generations and generations. We've got good reason to think this story dates back to Moses.